It's showtime. What's up, everybody? Hey, thank you for coming on back to the channel we've got going here. And it is a wonderful day. You know why it's a wonderful day? Because we are a live, not a live or alive, a live. Hi, I'm Russ. This is the Dapper Dividends channel, I guess, because that's what I called it. And you're here and I'm here and we're having this special moment together. I truly do treasure and love talking with all you fine, fine folks out there in the world. And where in the world are you? Well, we've got Canada in the house. I think Shamir, right? You're out there in Ottawa, capital city, somewhere over there of uh, Ottawa. We've got Lisbon, Portugal in the house, Michigan. What's up? All in the north and overseas, which by the way, a week from tomorrow, I will be in Dublin, Ireland on Monday. So not sure. This may be the last live stream for two weeks because it looks like I will be going to the Indy 500 next weekend on Sunday, the big race. And then we've got our trip to Ireland. And I don't really know if I'll be able to do a live stream. Plus, I'm going to be in Ireland on vacation, people driving around with my family. So uh, what's up? We got Ar <laughs> Arizona. Frank, what's up, man? Uh, we've got, ah, look at that. Amber is currently in the UK. I'll be out in those neck of the woods then uh, next week. Mississippi, thank you for all tuning in. And yeah, so you clicked on me on the billboard. Why? I don't know. I put myself there just to be different, something that might stand out a little bit. So the genesis of this is I was doing more reading, more research. I try to make time every single week to read and to at least contemplate what I'm reading quietly with no distractions, put the phone on mute, don't touch it. And I came across Something that Warren Buffett said in his 1993. Yeah, I know people are like Warren Buffett. I'm sorry, but I think Buffett and Munger are geniuses that are amongst us. And it's fantastic that there is so much that they have left us that we get to just dive into and try to understand a little bit of what they've done. So if you do enjoy investing in individual companies as I do, then I think these five simple questions that Buffett talked about risk-wise, looking at risk from a company, uh, I think can help us to be better investors. And we also have South Florida in the house. What's up, man? Beautiful. Hey, I actually will be in South Florida at the end of June. Uh, daughter has a volleyball tournament out there. So we're kind of uh, dovetailing that into a family trip, going to do Universal Studios and then finish it in Tampa. So that uh, that's cool. We'll be out there. So without further ado, everybody just sit back for, you know, hopefully five minutes or so. I'll try to tamp down the, the talking to at length and we can all just, um, as I bit my tongue, <laughs> we can, we'll let you just drive the show after I'm done with this little thing. We'll see where you want to take it. So there we go. That is that. And here is what I put together a little bit for you guys. So we got, there he is, Buffett. So here is Buffett's five rules for evaluating the good old risk. Number one in, is making money. So how predictable are the company's earnings and growth prospects? Really simply, it's just their long-term growth potential is what we want to look at. Uh, I came across a really great idea from Laura Garrett's. Uh, Rondale fund manager, where she said it's more important to focus on 10 years from now instead of 10 minutes ago. So I think that fits in nicely with that. Number two is the management. As you guys know, I just did a podcast and I was extolling the virtues of Mark Baum, the CEO of Harrow Health, ticker HROW. Yeah, they don't pay a dividend, but can the management effectively utilize the company's resources and maximize its potential? Is management going to do what is needed for long-term growth of the company? And obviously, we do see that earnings follow that growth, or the share price follows earnings. I said that wrong. So that's number two. Number three is alignment. And again, pointed out, I'm really enjoying Mark Baum. Uh, will the profits be shared with the investors instead of being kept by the management? We've seen that with a lot of stock options and a lot of financial shenaniganery, which I know is not a word that I just made up. So that is number two is, can we trust management not to be greedy? Um, 
there have been a lot of instances where management greed has led to the downfall of a company. Number four, and yeah, I realize the Ducks had <laughs> should take care of that someday is kind of blocking that. Is the price, uh, is the stock price fairly or is, that a, uh, is it at a discount compared to its value? We would ideally like to buy things under their intrinsic value. There's many ways to get to that, but honestly, if you're buying, you know, what was it, Coca-Cola at one point was... Oh, somebody will remember this. Was it? Didn't it have a PE of sixty or something like that? So if if it's a non tech company that's really growing quickly, we really want to just focus on if we're paying too much. But something that I've learned from PepsiCo recently, when I was buying them at one hundred forty two dollars a share, they looked pretty overvalued at that point. And as you just saw recently, we were pushing two hundred. Thankfully, for, for me at least, I think they shot up too fast, too far, too quick, and I expected a pullback, so we'll see if the pullback is sustained. Um, that's the thing with Pepsi. So they've been doing nicely, and thankfully I held on to them. And then the last one that Buffett touted was costs. Uh, how much impact will the taxes and inflation impact your overall return on the investment. So that might be something to consider if you are going to be selling, if you're going to realize short-term capital gains, long-term foreign taxes paid, things like that, that we might not control. And then I have a link below to the newsletter, the full 1993, not newsletter, the shareholder letter that <laughs> Warren Buffett put out. And this is, those were his words. And I just extrapolated those into a little bit easier for you. So Hey, those are some things you might want to look at and think about when you are going to invest into an, an individual business. So what did you think of that? What do you guys want to talk about? The rest of the show is here for you guys. And I'm just, I don't know, happy to talk about it. Ask questions. Do <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I didn't probably because I'm greedy. I it was at like a hundred or like a dollar forty-two. So I I don't know, Casey. I still think that PepsiCo, of course. Now I say that as and as you say this, you are uh, you know I was just reading about how Charlie Munger said that instead of trying to be really smart, you should just try to not be stupid and look at things that could go wrong. Like what are what are all the potentialities that could ruin something. So I guess you could extrapolate that to what could, what could ruin your portfolio, list the things out and then don't do those kind of like their uh, inversion, right? What they talk about, <laughs> you know, that's funny. Um, just reading Shamir with the P Hey dude, they've said that Buffett has that, uh, that child, the, the diet of a five-year-old, he eats peanut brittle and I think he gets McDonald's almost every morning on the way to work. He loves burgers and French fries and this peanut brittle again and sees candy. So Coca-Cola kind of eats like a kid. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking about it, Casey. And it's the it's it was a mistake what I did. I read the chart wrong. It didn't move. It, it blew right past. But I'm down 99 bucks on that call option. And always, I, I don't like to lose money on the call. So that would have been another 142 bucks at one point this week that I would have added on top of that. But, you know, we'll see. I, I still think it would struggle around 200. Um, I don't know. I'll reassess it this week. We'll see what happens. Uh, a lot of craziness going on. But again, for those of you that don't know, I have till June, July 21st. It's a covered call that I sold on. PepsiCo. Yeah. You know what? It's fun. It's funny, Shamir, right? With McDonald's. I always, I make that joke to, um, I don't get high in my own supply. I don't know. I, I, I lost my taste for fast food. I don't know. Some while back. Um, I think it was McDonald's. We went to, we stopped and ate McDonald's and then I just felt awful. I felt like a, I felt like a gasoline engine that had just put diesel fuel into it. It just, it was, my body was running rough. My body was saying like, dude, this really isn't food. This is not food, but I'm going to go ahead and try and process this anyway, process this anyway, but I'm going to make you pay a little bit for it. And yeah, I just, I don't know. I just felt awful. So maybe it was a bad meal, but it kind of really made me think like, you know, 
I think instead I'm just going to invest in fast food. And if other people want to make that decision to eat them, you know, but Hey, no, no offense. If you guys love eating fast food, my, my father-in-law loves fast food. My mother loves fast food. Sometimes I think they eat a little bit too much, but you know, when those people do, I always thank them for supporting the businesses that we own and being a patron of ours. Right. Let's see. Yeah, you, you might be right. Oh, thank you for the tea. My wife. <laughs> she yeah, she knows. Ah, yeah, you're probably right. So I guess, and you know, that's the thing where you're right with Starbucks. What happened was I was selling covered calls as it was going up from the mid 70s. And at $82, my shares got called away. And I thought, no big deal. I'll get back in with a cash secured put, a weekly cash secured put, and it it didn't hit. And I kept it kept going up, and then I kept trying to do cash secured puts until I didn't have enough cash left to cover where it was at in the retirement account, and then it just ran away. So I had had, I think I had those shares, a hundred shares at like a seventy six maybe cost basis, seventy six dollars of Starbucks, and got cute, man, got cute, got caught. And it's just, it's it's a lesson, you know, sneak preview. I'll be on with um, Kevin Burgess and Ryan Williams on Kevin's channel, by the way, doing his very first live stream talking about some of this stuff. And we, um, do I sound loud? Let me know if I sound loud or I sound okay. Does it sound distorted? And we, um, we're going to talk about things we wish we knew. And one of them is, I wish I would have held stocks longer, like United Health. There was a period when I was learning, and I want to say this was 2019. I think the number was maybe around 200 ish that I held um, United Health at. And it was only 10 shares, but it went up. And I thought, okay, it's overvalued now. I'm going to sell it and take my profits. Well, if I just held it, all those, the capital gains, the dividends received, I mean, the share buybacks that they do. It would just have been so much smarter to have left that money in and just not do goofy stuff like getting a few bucks on a covered call with a core position as we've discussed, right? So we'll see. Um, (laughs) Oh, really? McDonald's isn't... Oh, I thought you said fast food. Yeah. The way I try to look at it and tell the the Cheerins, the young baby Cheerins that we got, who aren't baby Cheerins because the one is driving right now, (laughs) uh, I tell them that Fast food is is like fun. It's entertainment. It's it's not food. It's like birthday cake. You wouldn't eat birthday cake for a meal. Well, maybe that's not the best analogy, but I think you guys get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, fat as you know, it's yeah. I think I think with fast food, I had shared on Twitter that McDonald's is one of the lesser exposed companies to AI, and I think they're gonna be fine. They're probably going to replace a lot of the low-income workers with, with the robotics, the fry fry guys, and the hamburger flippers. There was a video that showed the the fry fry master, or whatever it was, the robot. But you know what? It's it's an unfortunate thing, right? It's that whole creative destruction that we see people lose jobs, but on net, there's going to be new jobs created, and just. You know, I think people get comfortable in the jobs that they do and they don't want to leave it. So it's it's not comfortable. But if we didn't have creative destruction, we would probably still be back in the Stone Age and there's no way I would be talking to you like this. Let's see. Let's see. Shamir, McDonald's, QSR and Wendy's. Nice, man. And you, you, I think, uh, ouch, I, <laughs> I think if you're right, you do invest or you do eat, right? You eat your own cooking at... Um, Burger King, right? I will say though, it's been years since I've had a Whopper. I did like Whoppers though. Eli, I will get to that in just a minute. Yeah. Cup of coffee and an English muffin and sausage. And you know what, Frank, it's fine. It's, it's like, that's why I try to preface it by saying, you know what, if it works for you and you're happy with it, with the results, have at it, man. I, I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't, well, we won't get political. Okay. We could get political if you want. I don't advocate for people to use heroin or cocaine or things like that, but if you can do it in a responsible way and it, 
somehow doesn't affect your life negatively, you know, go for it. I mean, that's, I guess I'm a little more libertarian in that regard. Uh, I'm a political alien, by the way, I'm not a libertarian. I'm not, I don't attach myself to any political party. I am completely a political alien, you know? Oh, appreciate that, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. If you would do tap, tip, <laughs> tickle and tap that like button, whatever you got to do. Ah, I love, I love it, dude. Hey, you know what? If you enjoy it and it adds value to your life, look at Warren. Maybe I'm missing out on something. Maybe, maybe I should be following in the path of, uh, yeah. You know what? That's funny. I told you, I told you, I told you people that the, <laughs> you people, this is my weakness. I am I get, so in my line of work, I have something called a vice grip and I hold on to things I buy with vice grip like fervor. I have the hardest time, even the call options. I like, I've sat there, I swear to God, when a call option is two days away from expiration and it's at $2 or, uh, or I'm sorry, not $2. Um, it would cost me $2 to buy it back. I'll be like, man, all I have to do is just wait two more days and I get two bucks because then there's the 65 cent fee and that would knock it down to a buck 35. So with that 135, I, I, it's crazy. I just, and I think, I think as we, we invest, and this is probably something I'll talk about on with you, Kevin, we won't give it all away, but knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are, right? And to just, I have the hardest time selling anything. It's, it's ridiculous. And we will. Yeah, by the way, looking forward to it, Kevin. Um, I forget, it's 7 Central, I think, right? That's my time I got to be on. I'll look at it later, but I got time. All right, let's see, Eli. I'm going to do this for you, Eli. Why? Because you're a sly guy. I don't know if you're a sly guy. I've never met you, Eli. <laughs> don't get high. <laughs> don't go by either. All right, uh, we're going to look for Mr. Eli quickly at DFS. Oh, you know what? I lied. We're not. We're going to look at the dividend news first. Here we go. Quick dividend news because if I don't do it now, I'm going to forget to do it. And this is, by the way, brought to you by Simply Safe Dividends, their news. And then we will look. I'll just roll right into that. I'll roll right into your DFS from Simply Safe Dividends. And let's make sure we're sharing the screen so we don't have any problems. So dividend news, here we go. Newell Brands, which we talked about. That was this week, right? 520, yeah, I had to look at the time. Okay, <laughs> or the date. Newell Brands on the 16th, they cut their dividend 70% and they do own Rubbermaid, Coleman, and I think we also figured out they own Elmer's Glue. Cut that dividend pretty, pretty significantly. Uh, Magellan is acquiring Oniok. No, no, Oniok is acquiring Magellan. So look into that if you own Magellan. They reaffirmed Corterra, C-T-R-A. I should make this bigger, right? For some of you people that might be a little older. Uh, Northrop Grumman lifted their dividend 8.1%. Still only 1.69% yield, but... Still nice that they're keeping pace with inflation. There they go. They down they upgraded Oni Oak from 54 to 60, and that has a current yield of 6.53%. I have not looked into this at all. I'd love to know your thoughts if you're an investor in either Oni Oak or Magellan. Chubb raised their dividend 3.6%. That's their 30th dividend increase. 1.71% yield, though. They downgraded Western Asset High Income Fund. I assume this is a closed-end fund maybe, but a 13% yield. And Southwest Gas, they downgraded because they are separating, and I don't know what that is. It looks like they're spinning off something, kind of like uh, Exelon. I, I forget what Exelon spun off, but something similar like that. So anyway, if you own ticker SWX, Southwest Gas, look into that. This is one of my investments, Lyondell Basel, and I actually looked a little more into them deeper. I may head more of Lyondell Basel, 5.5% yield. I think it's only a 46% payout, free cash flow payout ratio right now. So uh, debt, not too terrible from what I remember, but they did a 
five percent increase. So high yielder on that. Uh, a REIT, the necessity retail REIT ticker RTL, they downgraded to forty. They're downgrading a lot of these that have office property exposure. And then Regency Centers is going to acquire Erstat Biddle in an all stack transaction. And I have not, <laughs> not looked into that one either. Why? Because I'm busy and I can't do everything. So for you, Eli, we will quickly, quickly look into DFS and I will just skim down through this. Pause the video if you want to look a little more in depth so we don't keep people that aren't interested on too long. Uh, dividend safety score of 45. Uh, this is a company I haven't looked terribly too far into. Uh, during the last recession, they cut that dividend. You got to remember to pause on these for a minute. Dividend growth is not on the screen because I went too big. It's too big. 12 years, and they had a 17% dividend increase last. So they may have another. Oh, they just did that, April of 23. All right. Uh, X dividend, two days away. So that's interesting. There's your current timeliness where they show that the dividend yields 29% above the five-year average. And yes, Casey, I know people always remember these are backward looking numbers. These tell us nothing about the future or what's going to happen. But if it helps you make a decision, there you go. Low free cash flow payout ratio, 9%. I'll just pause on these for a second. Decent, really nice free cash flow per share. Sales growth is down a little bit. Well, negative, it's down a lot. They've down to 272 million shares outstanding. So they've been buying back shares and their return on equity, 30%, 36% net debt. And we don't have interest coverage ratio because they're a bank or they operate on debt, I believe. And then if you want, I'll even give you an intrinsic value, Mr. Eli for DFS. They have an intrinsic valuation. Come on, baby of $181.41, so saying it could be about 44% undervalued, and their worst case is 107, so about 6%, and let me see if ownership has been buying. They have not. Who's been doing the selling? Let's see. Ah, so we have their chief of HR and admin officer, Robert Eichfeld, sold. And recent sales were also Carlos Manetti and the EVP president. I don't know what that means, but there you go. So there is some DFS information. Would any of you people, <laughs> you people, that doesn't sound right. Would any of you guys invest in DFS? All right, let's see, let's see. So there you go, Mr. Eli. And ah, this is a good one, Benny. Yeah, if you love fast food, but once a month, prefers taking in his McDonald dividend payments every quarter. Hey, so yeah, theoretically you're going to be getting, no, I'm assuming you are taking your McDonald's payments to buy some McDonald's or just taking it in, meaning like receiving the dividends because I'm receiving Mickey D's dividends too. Good. Yes. Everybody, if you can, if you have time, stop by the Kevin Burgess live stream spectacular extravaganza. It's going to be a soiree of sorts. I don't know any of that. That all may be false information, but I am glad you guys are loving Kevin's videos. The man knows what he's talking about. Listen to him. Let's see. Good ways to convince someone, my wife, that the power investing is more beneficial than regular savings. I would think you just show the inflation rate that the S&P 500 simply on its face, what, 10% a year, I think is the number. And if you have your money in a savings account, it's being eroded by inflation. Even if you're getting 3%, right now it's still being eroded by inflation. And we know when they get that under control that they're going to start um, they're going to start peeling back the uh, the interest rate. They're, it's, I think that might be the best way. Just if you have your money in a savings account, it literally is a melting ice cube. And if you put your money into just, you don't even have to think about it. Just if you don't want to do the time, if she doesn't want to, S&P 500, just buy 500 biggest companies in the U.S. stock market. And you will do the average of that, which is like, what is the dividend yield of SPY? One point, let me see. 1.54% yield on that money. So 
you're going to grow. You're going to get the capital appreciation, a little bit of a dividend on that. You can reinvest. And I think if you show that, um, I think if you show that chart about, as I'm listening to a dog fight or something, apparently outside, crazy. <laughs> uh, broke my train of thought. Anyway. Oh, the, 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 um, <laughs> Boy, that's kind of a you try and talk and you got dogs going. We don't have a dog, by the way. It's something outside. The um oh, what were we talking about? The this is part of me, just I'm a flawed individual, people. This is this is what it's like being a flawed human being. And yeah, I'm not perfect. I do strive for perfection, but I know perfection is unattainable. So why do we strive for it? Because we're imperfect. There's a mind mind screw for you. Um, oh, the chart. If you invested from 18 to 26 and then never put a penny more into the market, but you invested, and then the second person invested from 26, I think it was, to 65, the person that did 18 to 26 would have more money because of the magic power of compounding. So compounding, just tell her compounding, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, Kevin, good luck. Uh, Casey will not ever come on. And, yeah, that's fine. That's that's her. Yeah, there you go. See, and that's probably part of the reason why. Because a lot of this, uh, you know, so I, I know you guys have said I'm being too influenced by Casey, but she's somebody that has the same things that I want to aspire to be in an investor and the things I'm looking for, mostly. And... Uh, it's just if somebody like that is sharing ideas, why wouldn't you at least look at the ideas that they're sharing? That is crazy to me. Now, if KC was day trading crypto, I'd probably say like, yeah, I'm just not interested in that. Thank you. But but value investing and looking for companies that are undervalued and have great management teams and should continue to grow and compound their share price. I mean, that's that's what I'm doing. So Nice. More Canadian banks if earnings aren't too good. Yeah, I'm still tr trickling in uh, TD. That's pretty much the big bank that I've targeted. I, I have exposure to JPM and some of the other bigger ones in the mutual funds inside of our 401k. But as an individually held bank, as far as I know, the only one I hold right now is TD. And I'm not considering Prudential, ticker PRU, as a bank because they are insurance. Yeah, uh, Bank of America under $30. That might not be a bad one. I know there's been some analysts that do like Bank of America there. <laughs> there you go. Eli, have fun with that one. Any thoughts on net principal charge off rate up 68.9% year over year at DFS? On that, I've never actually looked into DFS, and I would have to think and ruminate on that one. Ooh, that's that's interesting, Kevin. So uh, breaking news, everybody. I guess I, I should do a portfolio. I, oh, by the way, I'm doing um, I'm scheduling some videos. I'm going to do a batch recording so I can have some stuff come out while I'm in Ireland. And it's going to be a short week for me. Like I said, Saturday, Sunday, I'll be at the Indy 500. And then Monday, we fly out the very next day. So, and then it's just 10 days in Ireland from there. So I'm going to be going to be busy and I won't be on social media that much, but hey, that's fine. Um, but I bought three more shares of 3M. I know I told you guys I would buy closer to 90. I just decided, you know what, since I do hold things very well, they're in the Roth, I'm just going to average down just a smidgen on those. I added them at 99.75, three shares. I may add one or two more. And it was right before the ex-dividend date, by the way. So uh, get, you know, three, four, what, four, $4.50 more in the dividends coming in. But yeah, they got issues, a lot of issues, a lot of litigation going on, and it's going to take some years. And uh, if we start dropping below 90 and 80, I'll unless it looks bleak and like the company may go bankrupt, which I still don't believe that would happen because they're so big. They're so integrated into the economy that I think any payments that they do have to make, they will probably structure those out over many years is what my thought would be. But 
point being, we don't know where it's going to go, how low it's going to go. We don't know what the future holds, but my guesstimation is, is that they are going to be okay for 10 years from now. I think we will still see 3M around. So I'm buying with that. I'm just going to forget about it and let it do what it's going to do. But AT&T, not really adding much more. And I, I really would like to sell at and and exit that position when it's over $20. And of course, it's easier said than done because if it gets hot all of a sudden and things look rosy and it's at, I don't know, 21, 22, 23, I will hopefully remember this. And this is why it may help to write things down. I may need to write this down. But yeah, just at and and Verizon, very capital intensive businesses. They have a lot, just they have to spend a lot and it's very competitive. So Yes, let's see. Yeah, I am very stubborn. That's true. And I'm, v- I'm very busy. Too too many things on the plate. I always say there's not enough. Um... Well, there's my bull case for, for 3M is that, and I don't know if you want to call that coherent, but that is it's in essence, it's the simplistic way I think of it is that in 10 years, a decade from now, 3M will still be around but we'll see in what form. I know they have the healthcare spinoff coming. Um, yeah. So I got caught up to you guys. Look at me go. <laughs> Look at me. I got caught up. I'm caught up in the chat. Uh, not a position in his portfolio. Yeah, I would look. I would look into that for sure. It's nice to think that great minds think alike, Benny. Right. Um, I did share the newsletter, by the way, the link is down below. Um, I want to say I'm less. Now, when I was talking with Mr. Williams, he said he wants to say like less. And it's, I don't think I use like a whole lot, but um is definitely my, my bugaboo. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's. I know it, and it's not why I wouldn't be, why I won't be going heavy. I think there should be a shakeup with management. I know they've had shrinking margins, and you know what? Like I said, I just this is just a long term holding. It's not a, a significant position of the portfolio, uh, the portfolio Leo, but it's a few shares, and I'll probably trickle them in if, if we get to ninety. Like I said, nineties, eighties. I'll few here and there. We'll see what happens. Tax harvested USB and wash. Ah, Washington Bank. I don't think you were the one buying them, Jason, right? Somebody said they had been buying Washington. I know it's the regional bank. One of the oldest in the country, too, if I remember right. Kevin, here we go, man. How do you, by the way, I'm getting over being sick. I got the day the day quill quicked in. The day quill kicked in. Did I say quicked in? The quick day quill quicked in. <laughs> it's like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. But yeah, I uh, started feeling it Thursday. And honestly, my my daughter did too, my 15-year-old. So hopefully that any sickness will get this out of the way right before our trip. Let's see. How do you allocate your purchases of your portfolio? 18 different holdings, trying to find a balance between them. Well, that's a good question. And for me, honestly, it's usually when one starts dropping in price. I haven't added a McDonald's in forever because it looks overvalued to me. So the positions that look overvalued, I haven't been adding. But then it makes me wonder, well, when am I going to add to McDonald's? Because I had been holding McDonald's since the COVID crash before that. But I, I bought shares of the one, I think one th- 35 may have been my lowest purchase and and then some in the 190s but it just dude we're pushing $300 a share and I was I would like to buy under 200 again but I don't think that's ever going to happen I mean unless we get another black swan event so yeah man I I just look for ones that are undervalued sometimes if it's fairly valued or a little bit over I'll use the x dividend date as a mental trick to add a few more and just as long as I still feel comfortable and confident with the company, um, I, so I don't like to drip. I don't 
uh, I don't, I just let the dividends collect. I cut it with new cash and then I target redeploy into something like that. That just looks attractive or I want to build that position up in for whatever reason. So it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's kind of a week by week basis on what I'm going to buy, just what's going on, where things are at. And I don't let the macro influence that too much. Um, the macro economics of things, but yeah, I sold out of 3M and Verizon and T recently. I'm right there with you, buddy, except for 3M, T and Verizon for sure. But again, I'm, I'm stubborn and uh, I, I didn't bookmark it again, or did I? So Casey had shared a, I don't think this is it. I know you guys can't see this. Oops, I don't want to leave that. Yeah, she shared a, a AT and T versus H row because I had said, you know, the best thing may have been to go into just sell all of AT and T, kind of hypothetically speaking, and go. Yeah, it's I don't have it up, but anyway, uh, H row Hero Health has just been vastly outperforming AT and T, and that's total return with dividends reinvested from T. But seriously, though. I just, I'm going to move on. And of course, because you know me, my fault, I just hold things way too long. I've been forcing to consolidate and it's been uncomfortable for certain positions that I've done that with. So we, uh, we all have this different journey and this different path and we have to do what feels right to us at the moment and not beat ourselves up too much for making decisions we thought were right at the time. The only thing we can do is learn from those to what we have going next. So that's, um, I feel like I'm getting paid to wait with AT&T and Verizon. And I'm hoping, <laughs> fingers, eyes, and toes crossed that AT&T will get above $20 again one day. My thought, my thesis on this is that quarter one, the last two years, quarter one has been their lowest free cash flow quarters and the stocks kind of gotten dinged for that. But then as we go through the year, they start building up. You can't see my hand. It's off screen. <laughs> they start building up their free cash flow uh, and reporting higher numbers on that. And the market likes that. So my hope is that by year end, we will be indeed over $20 a share. No guarantee on that, but that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, Washington Trust on the East Coast. There you go. That was you. Yeah, and they are an old, old bank. I know that. Small position of UNP, Union Pacific. I sold out of Union Pacific. No, it was Norfolk Southern and Union Pacific. I I wanted to buy more Nexstar Media, so I used some gains on Union Pacific for Nexstar. And Norfolk Southern, just I didn't like the way management was handling that East Palestine. Uh, train derailment at all. I just, I didn't like it at all. So that was a personal, you know, judgment on my end to just exit them completely. But I do believe I still have exposure to UNP and Norfolk Southern inside of the mutual funds. So that, that kind of makes it easier knowing that I'm still exposed to these companies and yeah, there you go. Just, yeah. Casey says uh, UNP has an insane moat. So that's, it's why Warren bought Burlington Northern. It it would be crazy to try and start up a company to compete with any of the big railroad companies. It would just be, um, it's not even doable. It, it, you know, so I don't think rail's going anywhere. I don't think AI is terribly going to hurt them. And yeah, it's just great, great businesses, I think. Let's see. <clears throat> and that's what I did. Like she said, trade around any dips. When we had a big pullback, I bought, that's when I bought UNP and Norfolk Southern and then they, uh, they ran up. Dude. The, yeah. You know, me too. Um, I was working at a post office in, where was I? Crystal Lake, Illinois. No, it was Orland Park, Illinois. Uh, shout out Orland Park post office. And there was a skid of, boxes going wherever and it had the 3m logo all over them varying boxes so it wasn't the same but the point is is that i see that 3m logo on safety gear on earplugs i mean they have 
they have material that goes into the street signs, the reflective material that makes the street signs light up with your headlights. And that's 3M doing that. So <clears throat> yeah, 3M, they're so integrated, but I mean, we've seen it before where ginormous companies get their earnings. Um, they can be sunk by litigation and lawsuits and bad management. So we'll see if they can. Uh, it's definitely a rough patch and a bad period right now. So we'll see if they can pull through it. Yeah. Stanky. What do you guys think about John Stanky? Do you think he has to go? You know, when I listen to him talk, I and I, I, I think if you want to believe something, you will convince yourself to believe it. But, man, I don't. I just don't get the feeling like he has his heart and soul into it. Like I do when I listen to other, again, like to shout out to Mark Baum and Perry Sook and who else there's obviously you have Buffett. I mean, Tom Gaynor from uh, Markel. There are so many CEOs that just, it's like they, like you say, it's their baby. They love these companies, but for Stanky, it just feels like, I don't know. It just feels very methodical and I need to, I'm going to say what I need to say to appease the shareholders, hopefully. And I don't know. It's, uh, it's one of my lessons. It's one of the things I wish I didn't do, but looking at the past performance and not thinking about the future and understanding the business enough was my fault with them. And you're right. They were legendary and they are legendary for destroying shareholder value. So and it's hard. A lot of us say, but they got a 6% yield or whatever. Well, when you look at their dividends reinvested over many years, it's not good. I, and if anybody wants to see, I can go ahead and do the um, do that seeking alpha chart. But it's, it's brutal, dude. It is brutal. Warner Brothers disclosed. Interesting. Yeah, I know, KC, you're a little bit bullish on Warner Brothers. I truly haven't really been listening to them or digging into them, even though I do still hold some, some of the spinoff shares. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to disagree with that, Shamir. I think a lot of us are chasing yields and you guys know, I even added, I think three or four more shares of tea a few weeks back. Cause I'm like, well, it's going to cost the average down just a smidgen and I will be getting those dividends now, hopefully, and here's the hope part. Hope is not a good strategy. Hopefully the stock price will stop dropping. That was at like, I think 1747. And here we are in the mid 16s. So just <laughs> Katie, it's not a very, very favorable name. So if you have a name like Stanky, dude, you better be on your game, but he has to be a good salesman, right? To have made CEO of, of AT&T. Uh, still in the camp that the war for wireless yeah, probably Comcast. And I did sell Comcast. I had that little 10 position share, uh, you know, and they're a company that I may look back getting back into. And, you know, you just gave a great idea. I'd love to know what you guys think about this, about tax loss harvesting my remaining AT&T, which is painful because in the, in the taxable account, I think I'm down. Well, let's look. Here we go, everybody. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Let's have some fun with looking how far down Uncle Russ is on AT&T. We're sharing the screen and we're going to portfolios. <laughs> portfolio Leo. So this is the consolidated portfolio view in that. But we wanted the bridge. So this one, this is simply save dividends, by the way. So let's see, gain or loss. No, look at ExxonMobil, 125% gain on that bad boy and 108 on Eaton. I've actually thought about selling out of them. I do have a 4% yield on cost, so um, they just seem to do so well. But we wanted loss. So here we go. Yucky, just yucky. I'm down 29% on AT&T. And that is for... Where's the loss? I thought they had the loss of it. Here, let me see. There you go. So in the bridge, this line right here, 
we have a loss of $1,600 on AT&T, and that is painful. And the average cost, $2,320. So there you go. Now, I guess I my thought was consolidating that into Comcast, which still, you know, 2.82% yield coming down a little bit. But I, mean, I don't remember what their free cash flow was. So July 3rd, that's their ex, uh, ex-dividend date. Actually, they had some nice growth. 7.4%, 13% 10 year CAGR, 14 years uh, uninterrupted dividend growth streak. Let me see. Well, their yield's 34% above the five year average, which it was a bit higher. And look at that. They just keep going up, dude. $41. I had them right around 29. free cash flow payout ratio. So that's pretty low. Let me look at their debt. Uh, Shares outstanding, $4.35 billion with a B. Sales are up and to the right generally. 11% ROIC, lowish return on equity. And I want to see their debt. 53% net debt, a little bit high. We'd need to see what they're doing with that debt and what their no, only 5.8% ICR. So we'd need to see what they were doing with that and see if we get a – But uh, you know, I like – I'm not one that's been huge on intrinsic valuations, which I should be, but what did I do? I'm talking and talking and typing to you fine folks. That um, – Comcast. But I like this because it it's kind of just a cool base number for me to think about – so there we go. They have an intrinsic value of $53, so about 24% undervalued, and on the worst case, 37 So if you wanted to, you may want to wait for it to get back to below, you know, right around 35 And let's see what they've been doing. And we've had only sells. So who sold in the last three to six months? This is interesting. I don't know what this means, Casey, if you're still on. This is the first I've seen that. Comcast Corp, 10% owner. So... I guess they sold their own on the open market. That's interesting. So they were the only ones selling, but yeah. And then you'll see there's, there's people, but I like alpha spread for that. Interesting. So yeah, that, that would be a thought would be to um, consolidate, take the tax loss harvest on AT&T, consolidate that into Comcast, but I don't know. I'm stubborn. I think I'm still going to give it till the end of the year with AT&T. And that may be a huge, Huge mistake. Uh, let's see. Okay, KC, you had a lot to say. I'm just skimming, skimming, skimming. Uh, about WBD, cool. That, yeah, do you guys, what did you guys do with your uh, Warner Brothers Discovery shares? Would you buy any more of them? There you go. That's it. So she thinks Warner Brothers could be an easy triple by 26. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. And there you go. I'm just going to consolidate all of AT&T and Warner Brothers. I'm not. I'm, you know, that would be an interesting thought experiment. But yeah, I know we've talked about that before with Warner Brothers debt. Again, I've, and it's because they don't pay a dividend. I've pretty much ignored them and I haven't dug into them. So I really do appreciate you sharing this with all of us that we can get your thoughts on that. Yeah, and they just keep going down. So there you go. Maybe would you, anybody watching, would you consider buying Warner Brothers Discovery? Let's see. I'm reading that, by the way. Yeah, Their enterprise value. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And okay. Oh, and this is the Comcast one. People who own big chunks of public companies have the file. Okay. Interesting. So, oh, I get it. So it's just a com. It's like a private person, or we don't know who. It's just it is saying a. Uh, I said Comcast them. No, so it's a person that owns ten percent, or an entity. I mean that owns ten percent. Oh yeah, so you tax loss harvested nineteen hundred. Hey, <laughs> cheers, Jason. You made me feel a lot better about being down sixteen hundred, and yeah, that'll offset. And I could buy back AT and T. So what I could do. And I guess this would be something to think about is the look when Comcast goes X dividend and AT&T. And because when you tax loss harvest, I cannot buy AT&T, not even one share in any account with my name on it, retirement or otherwise. So uh, I would have to, 
I could put that money into Verizon though. I could put that money into Comcast. And that's what I did with Verizon. I tax loss harvested Verizon and I put that money into AT&T just because it's similar. So if one, there's usually sympathy plays, right? If one starts shooting up, the other will follow. But that's a, that's a really interesting thought with Comcast to maybe tax loss harvest T, lock in that $1,600 loss. I realized the mistake that'll offset the capital gains on any dividends that I $1,600 at least worth of dividends I'll receive. Uh, and then if I wanted to, I could always buy AT&T once again, uh, but it would have to be after 30 days. So yeah. So interesting. Thanks for making me feel better, buddy. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, Kevin sold WBD and bought more tea. Ugh. Well, Hey, I hope it works out for all of us. Yeah, well, maybe your gut knew something, man. What? No, it doesn't. Why can't you? How would that sell the wash rule? I think I think you might be wrong on that. As far as I'm as far as I know, because it's not the same company. Um, the wash rule is just the exact same company, the exact same t- ticker symbol. I don't look at you seem pretty. I mean, that's the way I've always done it. And I haven't really had any issues, but that's that literally Steven is the first I've heard of buying a different company, triggering the wash rule. At least that's what I did. Yeah. So, uh, Paolo, Paolo, I can't say it. Uh, if you're in the United States, I, I don't know other countries, uh, if it's the same, but in the United States, it's 30 days. I believe 30, maybe 31, but to be safe, I just go 32. That's kind of my, my idiot proofing it. I do 32 days. So I believe it's 30, maybe 31, but I I believe it's 32. Yeah. So now this is interesting. Now you got me thinking, cause I looked into it and I'm, pretty, pretty dang sure that it is the same exact company, which is why uh, I know people have said, like, if you washed, you did Exxon Mobil, you can put that money into Chevron because they're two completely separate entities. Um, and now, I don't know, maybe you're confusing thinking of uh, tax loss harvesting tea in like a taxable and then moving that money to a Roth and buying it there. Because from what I understand, that would trigger the... Um, that would trigger the wash sale rule because it's you own, it's attached to your name. Yeah, that's interesting. I could be wrong, but um, uh, Eastman, Kodak, and Fast and all. Interesting. I just used uh, Kodak in my um, in my last newsletter that I put out this morning as an example. Yeah, you're right. It's so substantial. That's the exact wording, substantially similar. Yeah, that now interesting. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, because I know that was a big one with uh, SPY and VOO. I mean, you know, I, this is not the be all end all, and you're gonna, you got me thinking now, but I, from what I understand, People had wondered about, say, for instance, I were to tax loss harvest on 3M. Could I buy SCHD because 3M is inside of SCHD? And I believe that you can because it's, it's you know, it's not the same. So I don't know. I think that one, it's not the same. I want to hesitate on saying ticker symbol because 3M is included in SCHD, but Yeah, so I think I th- I think you're right on that. And I like I said, I remember reading, doing reading like Investopedia, Wikipedia, all the pedias, going to just different sites, um, seeing what they had to say. Let's see, Benny's neighbor, Benny, say hello to your neighbor. Oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> fun joke. I don't think I told you guys if if you know anybody with a cat, then you say. Hey, uh, next time you see your cat, tell him I said, pss, pss, pss. This usually gets a laugh. But Benny's neighbor bought into MPW. Yeah, yeah, I, 
I did a video on them and I think almost what, like 40% of their, so put it this way in a nutshell. And I know Darth disagrees with me, but from what I've seen, I think 40% of MPW's revenue is from two tenants, two tenants. And those two tenants are struggling to make rent payment. And I don't know. I know I talk with Darth about it and he says, no, they're going to be fine. There's nothing wrong with them. It's a great time to buy. I'm like, I don't know. I see it differently. And I, I would be really worried. I think the, there's a reason that their yield is almost 16%. I think the market is telling us, Hey, like this is a big red flag right here. So you got to be careful when paying for that yield. Cause otherwise, I mean, who wouldn't be buying a 16% yield almost, you know, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. T and VZ, they're both in the same industry, but you know, Oh, well, I appreciate it, man. And, and, you know, I'm going to focus more, I think in the future. So I I'm creating these videos. I got my schedule lined up during them. They saw our packing and everything we got going on. Oh, and by the way, I was wrong. Um, I, I said to you that my daughter's eighth grade graduation was last Thursday. It's this Thursday. So man, I am going to be pressed for time and I may not be able to get to everything I wanted to, but Hey, you know what? That's life, man. As Frank Sinatra said, right? All right. Any, any last questions? Let's see here what you guys want to say. I do appreciate that again, Benny. Thank you so very much. And, um, there we go. More MPW waiting for MPW's management to actually refute. Well, didn't they, they're taking Viceroy to court, right? They're, that's what I think I remember reading last was that they were filing a, a lawsuit. But f I think from what I read that it was a defamation lawsuit, but Viceroy was saying, no, we're not defaming you. We're stating facts about your business. So you need to refute the facts type of thing. And yeah, I don't know, man. I would just, I would just stay away. <laughs> oh, thanks buddy. Yeah. So eighth grade, I guess we all pretty much graduate eighth grade, but oh, I love it, baby. I love it. I was going to sing it. And I was like, you know what? It's people don't like when I'm doing the singing, but he's been a poet and a pauper. I forget. It's been a long time since I've heard that, but yeah, it and you know what's hard, dude? It's hard because you're right. A, we're giving up income, but the damn thing just keeps going down. And again, for me, it's it's so hard because I keep thinking, and this is one of the faults, is I think like, dude, I know as soon as I sell, as soon as I sell, something crazy is going to happen. And a week later, it's going to jump up like $4 a share. And that's like the thought in our minds, right? Like why we don't want to sell. So, uh, thoughts on DOC. What's up, Trey? What's going on, Trey? I've never looked into DOC. So I, I know that's another healthcare, uh, or health, not provide, um, like medical facility, right? Health, health facility provider REIT. I have never, uh, looked into them. So I have no opinion, unfortunately. Better opportunity in other stock. Yeah. And you know what? Just to build on that, like the thought is that you don't have to make your money back the same way you lost it. Right. So just that thought right there makes me think, well, I mean, I don't know. I'm so I'm gonna think on that one. I'm I may if if Comcast has a superior total return prospect to ATT, uh, I'm not gonna do anything rash right away, but in the taxable account. Um, if maybe if we're getting toward the end of summer, early fall, and T has still not pushed up closer to 20, then I might um, I might just do the tax loss harvest and buy buy Comcast instead. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, drip. I, it's just personal preference. Nothing wrong with dripping. Uh, when you drip, it forces you to buy less when the share price is high and more when the share price is low. So, hey, dripping is fine. It, there's really nothing that wrong with it other than maybe buying something that's overvalued, a little more of it if you didn't want to. But just, just my personal preference, you know. That could be too. That could be too. I don't 
own any healthcare REITs. I used to own Omega Healthcare and I did a video on it explaining some of the reasons why I got out, but I just, it just looked like the whole business model was weakening and yeah, it wasn't. Uh, that's a good point. That's, and I would be curious because I, there's got to be a healthcare ETF, right? Let's see. Yeah, Comcast is a great stock to put back into. I might just do with that. Like I said, I had, and now of course I wish I bought more. I bought 10, I had 10 shares. And if I remember right, it was right around $29 a share with a cost basis. And then um, I think I sold them to consolidate into more Nextstar Media. But I, I don't know, man, I'm kind of feeling more comfortable with that. I'm going to sleep on it for a few weeks and uh, really think about tax loss harvesting tea and putting it into Comcast, you know. Hey, look at that, Paulo. Good. I And I hope I'm wrong. I hope they still stick with it and continue to grow for you. And Trevon, I will answer this for you. It's murky. <laughs> It's murky because what makes me nervous is their penny increases the last several years, but they're just token increases. So they keep their dividend king status. I don't know. I don't know. And that's why the stock price has been so beaten down because of the uncertainty of all the litigation. And if there's one thing the stock market doesn't like, it is uncertainty. And we need to discern, decide if we're okay with that uncertainty. So like I said, I bought three more shares of 3M. It's going to be rough waters, choppy sailing for, um, I don't know, probably years. It's going to be a while until all the litigation, unless they can do like J&J, &J, reach a quick settlement and just, just get it over with, then I don't know where things are going to go. So we'll see. I don't think they're going to go bankrupt. I think they'll be here 10 years from now, but... You know, what that looks like from now until then, can't say. So I do appreciate that, man. Thank you for um, asking that question, man. I really do love it. I want to say this. No, that wasn't the right one. I had added some new videos, but I'll just give you a Kermit thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There we go. I do appreciate all of you guys. So hey, that's going to wrap it up another week. I... I may not see you guys for another two weeks. I don't know. If I have Wi-Fi when I'm in Ireland, I might just do a quick uh, maybe 10-minute holding the phone. But I don't believe I'll have cell signal. And uh, like I said, I think I'm in Indy five for the Indy 500 next week. And then the day after the Indy 500, I'm flying out to, uh, to the Emerald Isle. And I'll be there for 10 days with my family. So... It may be two weeks before I get to talk to you guys again. So uh, I do appreciate you stopping by. Thank you so much. And uh, hey, man, let's get it. Let's stack some more dividends and make some hopefully smarter investments. And I will talk to all you guys in the next live, whenever that is. Hey.